The High Cost of Hoodlums Hoodlums are not simply a nuisance or a danger. They are an expensive luxury. Most poor people would just as soon do without them, but they don't have that choice. Prices in low-income neighborhoods are often higher than prices for the same goods in middle-class neighborhoods. Sometimes the quality is lower as well. Customers may also be treated with less courtesy, consideration, or efficiency. All this is part of the price of living in a neighborhood where crime, violence, and vandalism are more prevalent. When academic researchers discovered that the poor pay more, their first reaction was that it showed the evils of American society. But despite the popularity of such conclusions among intellectuals and the media, there are serious economic reasons why hoodlumism raises prices and lowers quality. The direct cost of a higher rate of vandalism, shoplifting, and hold-ups are obvious. The honest customers pay these costs in higher prices. Even in a high-crime neighborhood, most people may be law-abiding, but they still end up paying for those among them who are not. They pay indirectly as well. Some stores close up and move out when the strain of coping with violence, vandalism, and harassment becomes too much. Once the store is gone, the cost of hoodlumism no longer show up in its prices. But these costs may now be even greater in terms of having to travel longer distances to find a store, a pharmacy, or a place to eat. For those too poor to afford an automobile, this price may be very high, especially if they are elderly, ill, or a woman alone. The price indexes that statisticians put together do not include the cost of an elderly or sick person's having to wait on the corner in the winter for a bus to go to the nearest market, or the cost of a mother's having to walk for blocks at night through a high-crime neighborhood looking for a drug store for medicine for a sick child. But the increased scarcity of stores is a very real cost imposed on the poor by hoodlumism. Precautions taken by stores that remain also raise costs. In some neighborhoods, heavy grates have to be put in front of a store when it closes at night to avoid break-ins. Guards patrol the aisles during the day. In short, extra costs are added 24 hours a day. More subtle costs are also added. Store space is used differently in low-crime and high-crime neighborhoods. Markets in high-crime neighborhoods must be careful not to have merchandise displayed right inside the entrance, where someone can grab it and run. In neighborhoods where crime and vandalism are not such preoccupations, virtually every square foot of store space can be used to display merchandise and earn money. Low-value items may even be set outside the store with no one watching them. Pay telephones and newspaper dispensing machines can be installed outside to earn more money without worrying that they will be broken into or put out of commission by vandals. When the same size store has very different amounts of space available for making money in different neighborhoods, then the prices charged are also going to be different. When it has to pay very different insurance rates for fire or other destruction, those differences are also reflected in the prices. Stores that sell appliances or other items on credit charge prices that vary with the risk of default. In neighborhoods where the risk of default is very high, the honest once more pay for the dishonest. The same principle applies when some tenants don't pay their rent. When a neighborhood is in an undesirable place to work, you are not going to get the most desirable people to work there, either as clerks or managers. Good people are always in demand, and they can pick and choose their location. The net result is that high-crime areas are likely to get less efficient managers and less courteous clerks, charging higher prices. Being poor is expensive. Statistics on poverty are too optimistic to the extent that they ignore the high cost of living in low-income neighborhoods that are also high-crime neighborhoods. None of this is difficult to understand as economics. What is difficult is to get the political and judicial systems to face this reality. Politicians who represent slums or ghettos are not going to get cheers or votes by saying that the basic problems of these communities are in the communities themselves. In politics, whatever the issue, someone else is always to blame. In this case, greedy merchants and landlords are blamed. When these greedy merchants and landlords pull out of neighborhoods they are supposed to be exploiting, then they are blamed for that too. 
The eagerness of intellectuals and the media to see American society as rotten lends weight to these political visions. If it was only a question of pinning blame on someone, then merchants, landlords, and bankers could be left to either defend themselves or ignore the rhetoric, probably the latter. But when very serious problems facing the poor are mistakenly diagnosed, the cures prescribed can make their situation worse. When judges delay the eviction of tenants who do not pay their rent, they increase the cost to tenants who do pay their rent. They also make housing a less attractive investment. It is not uncommon for a city with an acute housing shortage to have plenty of vacant office space. Judges are not compassionate to office renters. Political crusaders seldom pass rent control laws for offices. When politicians and community activists in low-income neighborhoods pressure merchants to hire people they don't want or to contribute to miscellaneous community causes, the net economic effect is to add to the already high cost of doing business there. In the short run, it is possible to get away with milking businessmen who are there, but in the long run, no one should be surprised to find them leaving and few replacements coming in. These kinds of political approaches do not merely happen to be counterproductive, they are necessarily counterproductive. Hoodlums create very real costs. If you are serious, that means lowering those costs, not trying to put them on somebody else. Judges, social workers, and politicians who want to give hoodlums another chance for rehabilitation need to think about giving the people another chance instead by cracking down on hoodlumism. The poor need it more than anyone else. January 27, 1984